when I'm deciding what to learn, I spend way more time than most people, like trying to figure out like, what is the critical, critical information that I need? It's mm -hmm. just like how it's, once, you, once you've ever had this moment one time with learning a language, when like you start learning a language a shitty way, where you're like, you're memorizing a bunch of random words that no one uses very often. Mm -hmm. And then like one day you're like, wait a minute, if I just learned like the 300 most common words, <laughs> <laughs> like, I know like half of the words that are useful. And yeah. that is just like a holy shit moment, but everything works that way. People who don't have that mental model of the 80, 20 rule, uh, they like, you can tell that somebody doesn't really have that model when they're like, this is going to sound crazy. But like, did you know that a small number of rich people have like a large percentage <laughs> of the wealth? And, uh, and it's like, yeah, that's, yeah. it's like same, same for the, the stars in the universe. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. The small percentage yeah. of the stars have most of the mass. Yeah. It's everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, twenty percent of your problems cause eighty percent of your pain. Twenty yeah. percent of your ideas or eighty percent of the value you create, etc. And so, like, you can just tell that most people haven't really they don't understand the pattern. So they're like, whenever it sees, they're like, "Oh my god, that's crazy that like such a small amount of people have so much wealth." Um, and but then if you're like really fluent in it, you're like, "Yeah, by default, that's how nature works." Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs>Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res three-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Emerson Sparts, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Thanks. Glad to be back. Glad to have you back. We are sort of continuing our theme from last time, which was learning how to learn. Uh, and I think today we'll be focusing on the areas of reading, comprehension, and retention. And I know as we were just saying offline, you've got a whole list of things in your mind that uh, I guess sort of like a simple toolkit people can access to just really enhance their learning per unit of time expenditure. 
So where should we begin? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I thought it'd be helpful since I would guess that maybe 40% of you guys listening to this episode did not listen to the previous episode. Um, and so, and that was uh, almost two hours, uh, mostly mm. covering one, like why learning is a superpower and actively focusing on getting better at learning instead of just randomly hoping to get better at learning is uh, a good use of time. We covered uh, a bunch of hacks for how to read faster. And then we covered hacks for how to select better um, content to read. Uh, you know, as we're experiencing exponential increase in information, it gets harder and harder to figure out what to read uh, because there's so much of it to read. Uh, so I thought a few minutes review of just the most important ideas from the previous two hours, because um, I'm going to build on those in this episode. And uh, so the review can be useful. Um, so real quick, uh, for me personally, um, I'm an entrepreneur and investor. I founded my first business when I was 12, and I have been building and growing and investing in businesses since. Um, I've also been obsessed with learning how to learn uh, for most of my life. I've been averaging about a book a day uh, for most of my adult life. Um, and uh, so I've been a guinea pig and, and I've been trying a lot of tactics for a long time. So and, I, and my goal for this episode is basically just like, I'm just going to machine gun like um, like somewhere between like 200 to 400 different like tactical things that you can apply. Most of these won't resonate for different reasons, but my hope is that like at least one to four of them, you'll, you, the listener will hear and you'll be able to take this and just start applying it right away. Cause it'll just really resonate. So I don't know what's going to resonate. So I'm just going to try a bunch of them. Um, okay. So a couple really important high level models from the last one. The first is a mindset, um, mental model. So first is the idea that learning to learn, um, uh, is like the ultimate leverage, um, because it's the root of every other skill. And so it's like the, it's the closest we can get to wishing for more wishes, uh, because instead mm -hmm. of spending all your time building up one skill, if you build up this one skill, then you can easily add any other skill you want, which is exponentially more important in a world of exponentially increasing mm -hmm. change. Um, so that's an important high level model. The other really important high level model is to think about learning to learn uh, using the, the lens of like weightlifting and progressive overloading. Um, and so the idea here is that you, in order to build stronger muscles, uh, what everyone, like every gym bro knows that you just have to go lift heavier weights. And mm -hmm. there's lots of ways of overcomplicating all this. Um, but like the only way your muscles <laughs> like grow is that you mm -hmm. have to overload them by pushing mm -hmm. them past their comfort zone. And then you're signaling your bicep to you know, upregulate and you know grow stronger so that when you go back in the gym tomorrow and you lift the heavier muscle, uh, or you lift the heavier weight, that you have you know, muscles to grow. And this is like kind of really counterintuitive in many ways because we don't usually like to feel like we're pushing ourselves, uh, but we have to. So if you take that yeah. mental model for weightlifting and you cross apply it to learning, uh, the same thing basically applies. You've got to push yourself. That's the only way to actually go faster. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so that's an important one. Now, now there's one tactical thing that, like, um, that that I, I talked about last time, but I, I want to talk about it a little more again because it's really, really, really important. It feels like the biggest cheat code. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So um, I call it immersive reading. Basically, what you do is you read with your eyes and your ears simultaneously. Um, so it sounds kind of silly. Like, why would you read with your eyes and your ears simultaneously? What I mean basically is that you're like reading the ebook at the same time as you're reading the audiobook with your ears. Uh, now it sounds kind of ridiculous, but once you get used to it, it feels like cheating. It feels like you've just taken the limitless drug and, mm -hmm. uh, somehow reading just becomes easy. Uh, mm -hmm. it feels like before you are reading this way, um, reading is kind of painful and slow and you do it because you want to grow as a person and, uh, you want to know the information, but the actual act of reading is, uh, is, is a struggle. It feels like the difference between like taking a hand crank and turning it to like watch a movie or like a flip book where you have to manually flip every page, um, instead of just being able to, um, like get into a flow state uh, mm. while reading. Um, and Can we on this one, because I know this is so important. I don't know if you did this last time, but can you like slowly walk us through the on-ramp process for this immersive reading? Like I know, I know you said it takes, I think around five hours to kind of get it. So are there specific incremental steps you take from hour zero to five to pick up the skill? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so this they're, they're, okay, the simplest thing you can do right now um, is just to download an app called Natural Reader. Now, Natural Reader is just a, it's a Chrome plugin, um, basically, or, or whatever, they have a desktop app, um, et cetera, a mobile app, where basically um, it's, you, you can just click on any sentence on the internet and it will just start reading it to you um, out loud. Um, and there's lots of like text-to-speech apps, but this is the best one. Uh, I tried all of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's just really seamless and it's just got all the right features. Anyway, but the, the core models, this is what you do. If nothing else, um, just download Natural Reader uh, as a Chrome plugin right now, or I guess you do mobile app. Um, and just like, whether it's, a, if you're reading a book, then just like try that. Um, it's it's really easy to use. Um, but yeah, just Natural Reader is the simplest way to do it. What I actually do in practice is I also use Audible and I use Scribd. Um, and I use, uh, 
Okay, I've got to stop. I guess, I guess I'll just jump into it right now. Um, okay, so actually, yeah, yeah, I'll just jump into that right now. No, no. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I'll just jump into that right now. Uh, actually, one first high-level mental model first is like treat learning like you're an Olympic athlete. Like take it as seriously as you would as if you were an Olympic athlete um, because uh, it should be that important because this is like the ultimate lifelong scale. Okay, so I wanted to plant that one again real quick. Okay. Um, oh, one other overarching goal before I get into this, because once I start, I won't be able to pull back out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, is that my overarching goal is to, I want to like have the largest, most positive impact I can have on the world. And one way that I want to do that is by becoming the number one wisest person in the world which I'm fully aware is a ridiculous goal. And I don't know what that means either, uh, but it motivates me and it gets me to keep working hard every day to try to like self-improve. So um, so that's what I'm working on. And that's why I read so much. Um, okay, so now that we've established the basics of like some high level models, uh, let's get into it. All right, so first there's like a um, four, there's, I think of like, um, if you want to become an Olympic learner, um, there's like four levels to it. So the first level is your goal is to establish a learning practice. Um, and uh, this is basically where you like read every day. I'll, I'll just qu quick highlight. So level one is like you establish a learning practice. Level two is that you increase your speed. Level three is you increase your comprehension. And level four is that you increase your retention. Mm. So um, so that's the high level. Now I'll go through them a little more slowly now. Um, uh, okay, so first for the learning practice. Um, the idea here that the specific actual thing is that like if you don't like set some sort of like clear daily reading goal um then you're just subject to the whims and vagaries of your motivations and uh, there's a famous quote that um has always really resonated with me which is that uh like losers you know have motivation winners have systems um mm -hmm. so basically you have to build mm -hmm. a system right here to read mm -hmm. um to read every day um and it can't and it has to be every day for some reason i found maybe you're different but i found that like if i don't do like I, the, I, the only way I'm able to make anything really stick um, is to do it every day. Um, mm -hmm. And so basically, this one's really simple. You set a, you can make it as complex as you want, but the, the core of it is really simple for level one. Set a goal for how much, how many minutes you will read and how, and when you will read. Uh, so, um, so first for the how many minutes. So let's say you're, you're hearing me right now. You're like, okay, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. It seems like a good idea to set a goal for reading every day. Uh, I'm going to read for an hour a day. Okay, first of all, great, hour a day, it's very ambitious. If you read an hour a day, you're like 99th percentile of the population. <laughs> Most people, nobody reads. Like reading yeah. is like a thing that everyone pretends to do, but nobody actually does. Mm -hmm. You know, like middle school sex or whatever. Everyone pretends yeah. to, no one actually does. Because it's hard. It's really hard. Um, it's cognitively draining. And Anyway. But once you get uh, it, just for the audience, like for me at least, I'm about an hour a day minimum up to two or three if I'm really pushing like working out once you get into that routine i'm a, i'm addicted to it i love it right like it is difficult to start but i just wanted to say there is some kind of light at the end of the tunnel in a way that you build up this inertia and it starts to feel very enjoyable as i'm sure you've experienced oh yeah yeah it's the most addicting thing the more that i learn the more curious i am the more curious yeah. i am the more beautiful the world becomes there's yes. just fascinating yes. questions to be answered everywhere yes. and i just have the burning desire to know everything i want to understand everything <laughs> i need to know how it all works uh and yeah it, it, you're right exactly right it becomes addicting the first time you go to the gym it's miserable and painful yeah. and hard and most people quit um but if you just start getting the habit of going there every day um the mid-curve take is like overcomplicating things and like trying to come up with a perfect routine um and then the like right curve take and working out is like just go to the gym every day and lift heavy objects. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. If you do that, if you do that, you will get big. You don't yes. need to. So it doesn't matter what you do. Just go to the gym, yes. read more, read yes. every single day. Um, and so, so actually, so you're exactly right. And so my advice is, let's say you're saying I'm going to read for an hour a day. So if you want to read like an hour a day and become a giga brain like Robert, um, you can do that, but you'll probably fail because it's actually really hard to read an hour a day. And almost everybody who reads an hour a day did not start reading an hour a day. Right. Uh, they started reading a lot less. <laughs> so, yeah. so my advice is like, don't read now. Don't set a goal of reading an hour a day. Set a goal of reading a half hour a day. Um, you have a much higher probability of actually reading a half hour a day. But actually, I would take that logic even further and say, don't do a half hour a day. Do 15 minutes a day. Hmm. Because you have a much higher probability of actually reading 15 minutes a day. And actually right now, it doesn't actually matter how much you read. The only mm -hmm. thing that matters for layer one, the level one goal here is to read every single day as a habit. Just mm -hmm. like if you go to the gym, it doesn't really matter how long you go to the gym. If you go to the gym and like work out a little bit every day, you will still get strong. So the most important thing is just that you get the habit every single day. So instead of an hour, go down to 15 minutes. Even it seems embarrassingly small, just read every single day, no matter what. 
One more thing yeah. on this before you move on. Uh, just to be specific, I, we're talking about reading like a book or a piece of content, right? This isn't, oh, I read emails at work for an hour a day. Right. Like we're yep. talking about actually setting aside time to pick up a piece of something that you want to learn or consume. I guess it's, this could be fiction too, obviously. And just dedicating that time to reading. This is not you browsed a magazine or you wrote emails or something like that. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and the high level model here is that like you, like everyone who's listening to this right now, like deep down, we all want to be our best selves, right? We all want to like, we want to self-actualize and we want to, we want to understand the world and we want to be better versions of ourselves. And so this kind of reading is like stuff that generally improves you, whatever you're curious about. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So another, another example of this that I really like is like, so I remember this example really resonated with me when I was a kid. The, the head coach of the Drexel um, basketball team had an outstanding thing where if you any, any kid who for all four years of high school um, went to the gym every single day for an hour, he would guarantee them a full ride scholarship hmm. to Drexel. Full ride. Wow. And he knew that like, well, any kid who's disciplined enough to go to the gym every single day is going to be like a beast. Like mm -hmm. one, they're just going to get really good at basketball by doing it for, um, you know, four hour, by doing it for an hour a day. Um, and uh, that they're also extremely disciplined and conscientious. So basically you want to do your own reading version of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also for establishing a practice, it's really important to have a, some sort of like th every single day you reflect a little bit on how your learning routine worked that day. Again, you're an Olympic athlete. Like you have to like reflect on how to get better at the sport. Well, if you're an Olympic mm -hmm. learner, you have to reflect on how to get better at learning. So, uh, an example of this that I do is every single day, um, my, uh, my girlfriend and I, we, we have like a one hour date and, and we go to the hot tub, it's called hot tub time. And then we spend the first, um, minute talking where I just reflect on like, what, did, how did my learning day go? And I, it's at least, I said it for at least a minute, usually it's being about five minutes, but basically like I spend about five minutes on average reflecting on like, what did I, what could I have done to learn better today? That's the question. And I have to reflect on what did I actually spend my time doing? And then how could I have done it better? And so I almost always have at least one takeaway for what I could have done better that day. And I can't mm. even express how important this is um, because I'm constantly realizing that like I wasted a big chunk of my day um, because mm. I, I could have done better, right? So mm. that, that's a really important thing. So add something to your daily routine where you're reflecting on how you could have been a better learner. Today. Is what the verbalization done? very critical there? Like this is something you want to actually speak out loud to another person or is this could be a internalized reflection? You can do it internal for sure. Um, I find that the accountability of having to talk out loud in front of somebody and having her like, she's she's also a really good learner and she also reads a lot. Um, mm. And uh, so, so she can be a helpful like um, rubber duck to talk to, but also like, you know, noticing when I've like, been doing something wrong and i do the same thing actually with my brother as well uh mm -hmm. it's a dinner topic um mm -hmm. so anyway so i think it's good to have somebody else but you don't need to as long as you are actually actively reflecting what you could have done better that's the most important thing um so okay so that's uh that's really quick on the like establishing a learning practice um all right so the next level again establishing a practice is level one level two is increase your speed level three is increase your comprehension and level four is increase your retention so how to increase your speed so we're back to natural readers all right so the biggest hack by far by far is to use natural reader um and just when you're reading stuff on the internet or you're reading books <laughs> you are using natural reader you can set it where it's like 3x speed um and your goal in this phase is very specific your goal is to get to 3x. Um, and I, that seems crazy for many of you, I'm sure, listening to this, um, but it's actually not. And <clears throat> you're capable of reading much faster than you think you are right now. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why that seems crazy. Okay. So the first thing is like, you can actually test this yourself really, really easily right now. So first of all, if you ever listen to something in 3x, um, try it. It sounds like chipmunks. Um, but uh, when you first hear it, but then after like um, about, I would say on average, the average person listening to this podcast, you're already like way smarter than the average person. You're listening to a show called What is Money? Um, mm -hmm. Where a bunch of giga brains are talking about some extremely complex ideas um, relating to economics and philosophy. Um, and so you're already interested in these topics. It means like the vast majority you can get to 3X, I would argue, in somewhere between like five to 20 hours of practice. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, so how you do that, it's actually very simple to start. Um, so when you're listening to podcasts right now, uh, or audiobooks, just increment up by 0.25x. This is the thing you can do right now. If you do nothing else while listening to this episode right now, just increment it up by 0.25x. And you'll notice pretty quickly, it's a little jarring at first, but like pretty quickly, your brain will adapt. Almost everyone is not actually reading fast enough. Um, so um, yeah, so, so, so there's a really tactical, simple thing you can do is just keep incrementing up by 0.25x. Your goal is to not actually understand 100% of what you're reading. Your goal is actually like, just push yourself to the edge of what you're, you're capable of. And if you understand like 80% roughly of like what you're uh, hearing, then that's actually a good 
heuristic for like you're you're pushing yourself to the edge. Um, so just keep doing that until you can listen to some things at three x. Not everything. Some things are too hard, and uh, mm -hmm. you're not gonna be able to. Do it. But like once you can listen to some things at three x, then you're ready to move on to the next stage, which is increasing your comprehension. Uh, but I wanted to like really really make sure this idea was clearly communicated is because this is like the lowest hanging fruit thing most people can do is like just read faster. Yeah. Uh, the most of what we do is like, they just like put on the podcast at a certain speed, one X, and they don't even really think about the fact that you go faster. Maybe they tried going up to 1.25 X and they just stopped there. It's, but it's like the equivalent of lifting one pound dumbbells at the gym. You yeah. know, almost everybody's lifting one pound dumbbells right now. <laughs> I was just going to bring it back to your gym metaphor, actually, that um, there's the, the principle of training to failure, you know, when you're working out. And this is something I, almost every day that I work out, it's like, you're trying to whatever, if it's higher up, lower up, high weight, whatever you're doing, you have to push yourself to that edge of failure. Otherwise your body's not going to adapt. Right. So it's exactly. that, it's that principle of overload you were describing earlier. Um, so that, that metaphor just rings true again there. I did have one question. If you're doing this with physical books, I assume natural reader, doesn't work for that? Or are you pulling up the digital book, running natural reader and reading the physical book at the same time? Or is there even a way to do it with a physical book? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So, so natural reader obviously works really well with articles um, and it works well with eBooks, but only, um, okay. So the way here, all right, basically here's the way I do it. So if I'm reading a book, I either do audible, I do scribd, scribd.com. It's basically audible with, it's an all you can read audible subscription. They don't have as much selection as audible, but like mm -hmm. uh, they still have a lot of books. Um, so that'll save you money if you're buying a lot of books on audible. So audible scribd or uh, libgen, uh, libgen.rs. So that's L I B G E N.rs. It's basically like a pirate bay for books. Um, and, uh, and so what I often do is like, I will uh, like, so I, I I'll buy like, okay. So basically like, you can get any book on LibGen for the most part. And then what you do is you just put it into the natural readers player. So you download enough LibGen and then you just like upload it to the natural readers like web app. Um, and then natural readers can play it directly from there. Hmm. Uh, what I do is I like to buy the physical copy of the book to support the author anyway. And I also like having the physical trophy of the book that I read. Um, uh, I'm, I'm like cool. a little child and I like to see <laughs> what I read. Uh, <laughs> like a video game badge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. what it is. These, yeah. these books, like these books over here, like they're my friends, you know, they're like waving at me. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, like, you know, I hung out with those guys for a long time. Like each of those authors I hung out with for hours and uh, they were just sitting, it's like sitting on a campfire where they're telling me everything they've learned about, right. you know, the history of the Persian empire or whatever. And it's, yeah. yeah. And great. So reference tool <laughs> to just grab it off the shelf and jump into something right if you i don't know like i i do i find myself doing that a lot with my books just going back to old things i read pulling them off the shelf yep reaccessing them yeah exactly i also like strategically position my books so that like books that i want to signal to myself like i put a lot of biographies like facing out from my bookshelves so that i can look at like you know my heroes uh and <laughs> they exist and like i should act more you know i should act more like john d rockefeller or bill gates <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. So, so natural readers, you can just live gen, download any book you want, and then you just upload it in natural readers. It's really simple to do. Um, and, uh, one thing I do is I always put on a British accent. Cause that way, like the, all the text speech is like almost human level, but like mm. the British accent sounds even more like it. Cause I can't even notice the things that the guy says that are a little off because I don't mm -hmm. speak with a British accent. Um, and it makes me feel sophisticated to hear British accents. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so, uh, natural readers and live gen are good. Um, but you can also use script and audible. So the way I do it with these is that I'll download the audiobook and then I just like pull up the ebook and I, I follow the ebook with my eyes while I'm listening. So for example, on audible, um, I have audible on my phone and I pull up, uh, car mode. So I tap this button right up here and there's like a car mode where there's like a giant uh, play button and a giant wind button. And then you can just like easily pause um, if you get lost when you're reading. So what happens all the time when you're doing this is that your eyes will like just keep like the audio is moving. You're like, oh shit, where was I? You kind of forget where you left off mm -hmm. and then you hit the pause button really easily. Um, you can do the same thing on script. Um, so whichever works for you, um, you can do. Um, so those are the, the main tools. Um, oh, there's other speed tools that can be useful here. Um, uh, okay. so. Bypass paywalls is another useful one. It's just a Chrome app that lets you, if you want to read an article and there's a paywall behind it, like it bypasses like a large percentage of paywalls on the internet. I actually pay mm. for a lot of, um, I pay for, I pay to read a lot of things, um, but sometimes there's like one article on some random media company website and I'm not going to pay for a subscription to the newspaper just to like read that one article. So right. bypass paywalls is good for that. Another one is um, video speed controller with hotkeys. It's a Google Chrome plugin. And um, it basically lets you like, you just using hotkeys, you can speed up videos, slow them down, pause them, pretty much any video on the internet, which is very important because most videos, like technically you can go on YouTube and you can like slow, you can, there's like, you know, five clicks away from like increasing the speed to two X, but it's really hard to change the speed and so on. So that app is invaluable and I can't recommend it enough. 
if you're consuming video content. Um, and then the last one I use, this is in the speed category. Again, our goal here is to increase speed is Readwise. Readwise is just like a read mm -hmm. it later app that has like more features that I, th I think than Instapaper or um, Pocket uh, that I find useful. So I just like save any article that seems interesting that I want to read later into my Readwise. And then I, I use Natural Reader within Readwise, actually. That's the main way that I uh, they read articles. On the, the uh, Readwise, yeah. which I use as well, another big feature that I really like is the highlights I do in Kindle. I can export to a PDF via Readwise. Yep. So if, for me, I like to highlight stuff X and then use that in some of my writing. So versus having to retype it from Kindle, because it doesn't let me copy and paste from Kindle. I don't know if that's a user error or a, or a feature of the, the program. But when you export to Readwise, read you can export to PDF and then you can copy and paste. And you also get that daily email feature, which is kind of cool, kind of like a re... It's a reminder. It shows you prior highlights from other books. So it's kind of a reminder or a reiteration of things you've learned previously. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It can be really useful for that. Um, and I'll cover some more of how I do highlighting. Um, first, a couple other quick things while we're on the topic of speed. The reason I'm talking, the reason I'm lingering so long on speed is because actually the other stuff, weirdly enough, comprehension and retention don't matter nearly as much as speed for most people mm. that are listening to this because the speed is the easiest thing you can fix. Um, it's the one pound dumbbell analogy. Um, so I really mm. want to make sure, that if nothing else, you like, you, you increase your speed by somewhere between 50 to 200% as a result of reading this. Because uh, over the course of your life, you know, if you increase your speed by 100%, you'll read twice as many, you can read twice as many books and right. you'll just exactly. know twice as many things. Yeah. And, and I'm saying all this with like little to no decrease in retention at all or comprehension at all. Um, so this is like one of those, like, it's almost like a meme that, oh, you only use 10% of your brain or something, mm -hmm. but that's actually true when it comes to reading uh, mm -hmm. for most people. Like you're actually just only using a fraction of your brain because um, you just haven't tried lifting heavier weights. Um, you know, uh, and, and it's just really not that hard to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, so one other thing too, so on, on the reading side, um, so obviously I'm talking a lot about audio, like audio reading where you're listening with your ears and you're reading with your eyes. This obviously most of the same stuff applies, um, just with audio only if you're listening to podcasts or whatever. Um, but if you're, if you, if you insist on reading the old fashioned way where you're still just like staring at words with your eyes and having to go from sentence to sentence with your eyes, um, so if you're going to keep reading that way, um, which I don't recommend, but if you are going to keep, and obviously I do read some things that way, so I shouldn't say I don't recommend it, but like try to do audio reading. It just works better, but for, for many things, but um, if you're reading this way, the most important thing you can do is you have to basically make sure that you're moving your eyes from sentence to sentence and not getting stuck. Um, and so the best way to do this is just to use a tracer. So basically you just grab a pen and you just move your pen or you do it with a finger or whatever. You just move it underneath every sentence and it just keeps you moving forward. Because what actually happens, one reason why most people don't read very much is because reading is a miserable experience where you don't actually go anywhere. You actually don't read anything because you're just getting distracted so often. Mm -hmm. Dog barking, birds chirping, someone going mm -hmm. by, or you've been hearing a squeaky thing as other people go around the house. Um, and it just pulls you out of it. So um, so, so with this one specifically, um, if you use a tracer, it keeps moving forward because basically what happens when you're driving, like when you get in a car, you like you get in the car and you hit the gas pedal and you, you drive on a straight line, right? Mm -hmm. Well, reading doesn't usually work like that. Usually reading is like you start reading and then you get distracted. You basically drive off the road, right? And then you gotta get back <laughs> on the road again, which is like, oh, where was I? Like, oh man, it takes you a while to figure out where you left off. And then, then you get back on the driver's, you get behind the wheel again, you start driving, you drive off the road again. And you basically are just like spending almost all of your time driving off the road, trying to figure out where you left off. And you're mm -hmm. actually, if you measure people's eyes, this is the craziest thing. They don't realize this, but like, you're actually just not reading. You're literally just like staring in a space. Most of the time you're reading. It's actually like a, it's, it's, if you, if you actually like watch your friend read, um, for a long period of time, it's, it's like haunting. Cause it makes you realize like, wow, we're all just NPCs, aren't we? Like we think we're present and we're actually doing things, but we're actually just like staring in the space. We're just robots that are off. Uh, most people are not reading when they're reading. They're literally just thinking about like what they're going to have for dinner. They're thinking about like a thing that happened in the middle school. Um, they're thinking about something else altogether. And they're literally just not even moving their eyes from sentence to yes. sentence. Yeah. So the tracer is a good way to do that. Another thing you can do, which I recommend is like basically use a, um, use like a clicker or like a, you could like, I have a clicker like this. It's like one of these little mechanical things or a little digital one. Um, every time you notice that your mind is wandering, just click. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, actually, that's kind of getting ahead of the next one. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the next one now. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. first, first, okay. The last thing on the last thing on the on the actual reading speed side is like you have to like ruthlessly eliminate uh, all distractions from your environment. Um, so like you have to think of like what time of day are you reading? Like exercise, dehydra dehydration, hunger, mood, white noise. Put in headphones with white noise so you don't have audio distractions. Um, make sure you're in a comfortable place, good posture. Don't lie down, lying down, unless you're trying to fall asleep. Doesn't, you know, you tend to not read as well, ergonomically mm -hmm. good. Um, you know, if, if you're, yeah. So there's just, you have to take those things really seriously. They actually matter a lot. Even if they don't seem like they do, they actually, I found matter quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's on the speed side. I did promise I was going to talk about comprehension and uh, retention. Mm -hmm. So, all right, time to move on to that. All right. So comprehension. So, all right. So 
usually when, when, when I talk to people all the time, they're like, hey, how do I, how do, how do I get better retention? I, don't, I feel like I read a lot, but I don't retain anything. Um, the actual bigger problem for most people is not that they don't retain anything. It's they actually didn't understand it in the first place. Like they didn't mm. actually comprehend what the author was saying um, because there's this, it's easy to feel the illusion of progress when you're reading. Um, and so there's all these like just incredibly fascinating studies showing that people they're, they're given like they're they're basically they they have people read something and they're quizzed on it like immediately afterwards and people can't remember like anything you know and you mm. all know what that's like, right like you mm. read something uh, for a class and then you got to the end you're like wait I don't remember anything like did I learn anything from that <laughs> um, and um, to some extent like you did learn things that are just hard like i, I think there's like a uh you, you learn things that you can't say like there is like deeper knowledge that you gain from it but like a big part of it is that you're actually just not you're literally not actually comprehending the sentences and and it's easy to think that you are when you're actually not so what do i mean by that um all right so right now i want you to think of a number actually here's here's a question for you robert uh when you listen to a podcast the average podcast right now what percent of all of the sentences do you think that you comprehended where like the, the 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 waves went into your ear and you were actually paying attention to the sense i know that you understand most like you're a smart guy so like if you're actually paying attention you probably understood most sentences people said but like what percent of the time when someone said a sentence did it actually go in your ear and you actually paid attention to it to be able to comprehend it uh you know my instinct on this because i feel like my experience of listening to a podcast is i'm following the theme I'm usually trying to listen to kind of difficult podcasts to understand. I like to push myself in that way. And I'll often be hit with a sentence, like one line will be like the, tr the truth bomb or whatever hits. And I'll be like, whoa. And I kind of like zone out on that one sentence for, I don't know, 10 to 20 seconds. And it, for that amount of time, I'm completely tuned out. So I think if you factor that in, maybe like a third of the podcast I'm comprehending because I'm tuned out on, you know, one sentence to the exclusion of the next 20 seconds of the podcast somewhat frequently throughout the, throughout the, the listening experience. Yep. Um, yeah. My best guess is that the average person um, only actually comprehends about 10% of all of the sentences in a given um, podcast. And this would cross apply to audiobooks too. If you're listening to an audiobook while you're moving around. Right. There's just too many distractions. There's way too many other things that can occupy your mind. And yeah. what happens is like, and this is what I noticed myself too, is that like, uh, I, I'll hear a sentence that I'll understand, I'll comprehend, and then I'll just think about other stuff for a while and be like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be listening to that podcast. And then I like to exactly. back in. And exactly I'll... how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I guess exactly. the third, but you're right. It, might, it could be as low as 10%. I'm not sure. And I think it feels like it's higher than 10%. Um, when I ask other people this question, they usually give numbers higher. But I think the reason why is because um, you can kind of guess what people are saying. Um, and you have some knowledge of what's going on in your peripheral awareness of mm -hmm. the conversation. <clears throat> um, and so it's not literally 10%, but it's like, but I think that's in the ballpark. Um, and so, 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 because I, I think that reading, basically like the way that your eyes, um, like we feel like we have uh, the ability, like if you, if you look from left to right like this, um, it feels like you're seeing everything, but actually um, your eyes are doing what are called saccades, where like you see this thing over here and then you see this thing over here and your brain just guesses what's in between. Right. Um, and uh, the same thing happens with reading, where when you're listening to a podcast and you space, you're like spacing in and out, in and out, in and out, your brain just guesses what's in between. And it feels like you were actually listening uh, like most of the time, but actually you weren't. And if you're quizzed on it, you'll find out very quickly that you weren't. Um, mm. Sometimes you can guess just because of the context, you know, you can guess, but like, yeah, you weren't actually even listening to what the people in the podcast were saying. Wow. Um, and so this is like a crazy high leverage um, intervention point because, um, if the average person, if you're operating at 10% efficiency right now, we're actually only comprehending 10% of the sentences in a given podcast, then in theory, if you could get to, let's say 50% comprehension, then you would 5X, 5X your um, like information, you know, comprehended, right? Yeah. Um, and it's actually not that hard. I, I, I've like been, I've been trying to solve this problem for a long time and I have some hacks. Um, uh, okay, so a couple hacks. All right, so the first one is, um, this one's really hard. To, I shall use the one that's really actually really easy to implement first. Okay, so I'm obsessed with like these clickers right here mm -hmm. um, because they're basically like meditation objects. So a bunch of us, I'm gonna switch. I'm, I'm basically gonna be, I'm gonna start sharing a whole bunch of ideas about how to um, maintain uh, awareness um, and concentration. Mm -hmm. Most of these ideas I just cross applied from, I, I went really deep um, over the years into various types of uh, contemplative practices, um, mm -hmm. like Eastern traditions, uh, like mindfulness, meditation, things like that. And uh, basically it's like, 
cross applying all the best ideas to Olympic learning. Um, and the idea of the meditation object has been the biggest, like the gift that keeps on giving. Okay. So the basic mm. idea here is that you just like, while you're listening to a podcast, you hold one of these things in your hand. Like this is like a little mechanical clicker, like track coaches use to measure laps. Mm -hmm. This is a little digital version that just counts it. So this digital one, you can't see it, but it has 14,000, um, ticks on it. Cause I've clicked this thing 14,000 times since I started using it. Uh, uh, recently. And then this one has about 1100. Okay. So basically what I'm doing is I'm walking around my podcast. I hold this thing in my hand. Okay. First of all, why do you need to hold a physical thing in your hand? Um, the main reason for this, um, is because it reminds you that it's there by holding your hand because you constantly like hundreds and hundreds of times a day. I'm like, why am I holding this weird, like <laughs> ugly yellow oblong shaped thing in my hand? I'm like, Oh yeah, it's cause I'm supposed to be paying attention to the podcast. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> That's um, great. so then I'm like, okay, pay attention, you know? And then yeah. I, I start paying attention again. And, um, and so the main thing you do is like every time you uh, notice yourself spacing out, you click. Just like when you meditate, when you do a focus on your breath meditation, um, like whenever you notice, like your, your goal is to like count your breaths, which I also recommend, by the way, you can just count your, like if you're reading, like every, basically what I do now, actually, actually there's uh, there's so many levels, Trevor, what, what do I explain is that? Okay, so the simplest way to do it is I just click every time you notice your, your attention wandering. Just like how every time you notice that your attention is no longer on your breath, um, you notice it when you're doing a, you know, focus on your breath yeah. meditation. Um, you basically do the same thing for reading. So this is like the single most like useful, um, tactic that I can recommend for increasing your comprehension is just like, hold something weird in your hand. It doesn't have to be a clicker like these. I find these things satisfying to click. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but like you could hold like your headphones case. Um, you could hold a pen, you could hold anything. Um, you can also, if you're, if you're doing this while reading at your desk, you can just like take a, like a scratch pad and like make a check mark every time you notice your attention, mm -hmm. um, is wavering. Cause what happens all the time is let's say you're reading, um, you get distracted and like you're, it's like you're driving the car, you're driving the car, you draw off the road. Mm -hmm. uh, your goal is to get back on the road as quickly as you can. And if you get in the habit of noticing when you're off the road, then you're more likely to quickly drive back on the road. You're more likely to quickly right. go back to like, let's okay, be reading. Where was I again? You go back to that sentence and you pick up from there. So either make check marks or have clickers. These things are, you can get these on Amazon, by the way. Just go on Amazon and search for like hand clicker and like you'll see some mm -hmm. they're super they're like, you know, 50 cents each or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also just like tap. So this is one thing I do if I don't have anything with me at all. Um, I'll just like, I'll hold my fingers out in weird angles. So I remember like why I'm holding my fingers at this weird angle and I tap. You can tap on the mm -hmm. table, you can tap on your head. Um, this is also like how you, this is weirdly enough, this is how you induce lucid dreams too, uh, which is I mm. think fascinating. One of the most common tactics for inducing lucid dreams is to tap. Um, so anyway, so, so the most important idea is though, that you're like, wait, what is that thing I was supposed to be doing again? Oh yeah. Paying attention. And then it brings you back to the, it brings you back to whatever you're reading so that you'll, you can go from, and I, it's, in my experience so far, I started off at about 10%, um, comprehension. So again, 10% of all the words of all the sentences that were entering into my ears, uh, I was comprehending. And now I think I'm up to about 60%, which hmm. is still abysmal, like abysmal, only 60%. <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, maybe six times better than it was before I started doing the clicking. Um, so I can't recommend that enough. Now, how do you measure that? Or is, are you just sort of estimating that you've gone from 10% to 60%? Um, so weirdly enough, okay, so this is, it's hard to, okay, there's gonna be two different, okay, so do you, how much experience do you have meditating? Uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, I've had an on and off practice for probably eight years. Cool. Okay, so, um, I, well, okay, there's two ways to measure it. One is when I first started off, I just measured it literally by counting the number of times I clicked. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I was able to see, um, like based on how many numbers, like how well I was doing. Um, and now I, I still do that, but I can just sort of know because I'm just, I'm just clearly way better at it. And so I'm mm -hmm. like, just like how, when you first start doing, so when you first start meditating, um, you're monkey minding all the time, like you're mind wandering mm -hmm. constantly. And like, mm -hmm. you, you, and so it's a really common way to start is like, they say like, just focus on your breath and count, you know, just count up to as high as you can, or like count to 10 over and over or whatever. And you find out very quickly that like, you really suck at concentration <laughs> mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're like three breaths in and you're already like thinking about what to eat for dinner. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's kind of the same thing where like, when you first start out when you, when you're an inexperienced meditator, like you need to count count. Um, and then eventually you don't need to count anymore because it's just obvious that you're still on your breath. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm in, I'm in more of the, like, it's obvious phase now, but I still use these things as backups to make sure that I'm gotcha. Paying. Yeah. Yeah. My experience was counting is definitely essential in the beginning, but at some point yeah. you get into just the feeling like, I don't know, focusing on the actual physical sensation of breathing in and out is now Typically, typically adequate. I still count beginning when I'm first sitting down to meditate, but then I get into that just feeling phase. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good way to quiet the mind without counting, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, big fan of counting in the beginning. Um, yeah. Count, count. Um, another thing you can do to increase your comprehension, like what percent of what you're actually comprehending is um, to test yourself on it, which is hard in practice, but it's easy depending on your topic area. So if you're studying anything that's hard science, like 
uh, like for example, uh, at various points I was interested in, like I wanted to see if I could pass the US MLE, the medical licensing exam, basically the doctor test. Um, mm-hmm four months. And, uh, so I was like, just, I was like, just smashing like courses. And then I was, it, it's really easy to test yourself because there's usually courses built in, um, mm-hmm. like tests built in. So I can see literally the same questions from the USMLE. And so I was able to see if I was actually, um, learning it or not. And this is how, by the way, a lot of these tests I'm telling you, like I tested a lot of these with these kinds of things this is how I could tell that they were actually working. Mm-hmm. So for example, I would try like going through, um, part of it with like using the clicker and then part of it without the clicker. And I just noticed that when I was using the clicker, I was paying much closer attention. I was comprehending a larger percentage of all of the, uh, sentences. And then that would manifest in the form of, I would get better, um, results on the like quiz questions at the end. Same with the bar. Mm-hmm. Like I was like studying for the bar at one point, just because I wanted to see how long it would take me to actually pass the bar, not mm-hmm. as an actual lawyer, but just because I'm weird like that. <laughs> and, uh, I just see that like when I was doing these sorts of weird clicky things with my, these meditation objects that like I was paying closer attention and I was I would, it was just op- the answers to the test questions were obvious. I was like, well, of course I read this and the answer is this, but yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. And it's also like, those tests? Yeah. go ahead. Hmm? Did you pass those tests? I never actually took them because I oh. concluded that like to actually be able to pass them would take more time than I wanted to spend on it. Gotcha. Um, and it was mostly re- memorizing like things that didn't seem likely enough to be useful later. Um, right. um, so I, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm really glad now, now that like, you know, chat GPT can pass, uh, the bar and the, uh, assembly. <laughs> like, seems right. even less- <laughs> like useful yeah. to have memorized all those random um facts um yeah, uh, yeah. anyway so so weird interestingly enough one of the most robust findings from the whole field of learning to learn there's a small academic field um, that basically studies you know the science of learning and um the one of the most robust findings they have is that like people tend to not actually like comprehend much of anything unless they know they're going to be tested on it later hmm. uh and because somehow your brain just like doesn't care that much Unless, but if you know there's a test coming, then like even even if it's a really unimportant test, your brain just pays way closer attention. Um, so yeah, so these clickers are like a good hack for getting around that. Mm. Okay, so that was so as a, as a, as, a, as a recap, we had level one was establish your reading your daily reading practice. Level two was increase your speed. Level three was increase your comprehension. Um, your goal, I think your goal should be basically assume you're at ten percent right now. Only ten percent of the sentences are actually being comprehended. Try to get that up to fifty percent. That's a five x increase in your mm-hmm. like learning, you know, efficiency, which is humongous. So the the reading speed one, it, I think about this in terms of like what is the total amount of information you can consume um, over a certain period of time? The, the reading speed one will get you up to, um, let's say the average person who's listening to this is listening to podcasts right now at like one point, uh, we'll just say if you're listening at one X um, mm-hmm. and you get up to like listening to most of your podcasts at two X, that's a two X speed, you know, mm-hmm. increase, which means you literally double how much you consume and your retention will be pretty similar. Um, mm-hmm. So that's like, you literally just double how much information you can consume by going from one X to two X. Um, I would predict that like, uh, 90, over 90% of people listening to this podcast right now, um, it, you should, you should, you should definitely be listening to most podcasts at least 2.25 X. Um, and if you're not at 2.25 X, you probably haven't pushed yourself hard enough because you can, um, just with practice, it takes some practice, a little weird at first, but you'll get used to it. Um, okay. So, so, you, but let's say you double, you double your reading speed from the, from level one, increasing your speed, just going faster Then the next level of increasing your comprehension. If you go from like 10 to 50, 50%, then that's a five X increase. Um, and how fast you can learn. Um, and now we're at the level above that, um, which is, uh, increasing your retention. All right. So this mm. is what like most people ask me about. Um, this one is much harder and I don't have any like slam dunk. This is trivially easy to do hacks. Like the other ones are really easy. The first hack is like, just click whenever you notice your, your attention wavering, um, and increase your speed by 0.25 X increments until you get to the yeah. point you can read some things at three X, right? Those are really easy. You can do them right now. Retention is not as straightforward as that. Can I ask, sorry, one question before you dive into that, just distinguishing comprehension from retention. I mean, I think most people probably get it, but it seems like I guess comprehending is your grasp of it. Retention is holding that grasp over time, being able to access it in the future, something like that. Yes, um, exactly. So comprehension is like, did you actually hear the words that the like podcaster said or the the author said? Right. And then did you like comprehend them? Because it's, it's like, this is, this is like a humongous invisible anchor on people's learning right now is that they literally aren't even comprehending the words like they're going in one ear and not the other and there's no mm-hmm. there's nothing going on in between like they just mm-hmm. go in your ear and they bounce off because you're again you're thinking about food or you're thinking about crossing the street or you're thinking about like what your boss said to you and you're, mm-hmm. you're just literally not even compre- it's not that you're not capable of it. of course you are like the idea is not that complex but you're you're they're just going you're distracted in one ear and the other. yeah you're distracted right you're yeah. just distracted we're monkey mining all the time right like all the time we're rarely ever actually concentrating on mm-hmm. our on the book or on the article or the mm-hmm. podcast we're thinking about other stuff all mm-hmm. the time so improving your concentration, is, uh, your comprehension is all about like actually st- stably directing your attention at 
the, the book. Mm. That doesn't mean you're going to retain it later, but at least you will have one time like <laughs> actually comprehended the idea. Um, and that leads to you know, retention, but it doesn't guarantee retention, but right. it's a necessary step towards retention. Got it. All right. So level four, you're, you've got up to level four now. And by the way, I would say like, I wouldn't even focus on retention at all until you have like at least gotten up to, again, from a speed perspective, you can read some things at 3X. Some things are too hard. That's fine. But if you can read some things at 3X reasonably comfortably where you like are, you're getting maybe 80% of the stuff, then move on to the next phase. The next phase is increasing your comprehension. Let's use the clicker. Uh, and only once you feel like maybe you're at like 50% on that, then I would go up to, um, or you're, you're sometimes, you're often at 50% uh, comprehension, then go up to retention. Because um, retention is a much harder one than the first two. Those are the, the two ones below are much easier, actually. They're more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Just practice those, you'll get better at them, and uh, you'll get there. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, retention. All right, so the idea here is that when you, you, you're you reading fast and you're comprehending a, like a, you know, maybe 50% of, of all the words and sentences, um, but you have to store it in your brain in a way that you'll actually be able to retrieve it later. Um, okay, so how do you do that? Your goal here, first of all, again, if you're thinking metrics, your goal in the first one is get to three acts sometimes. The second one is get to like 50% um, comprehension efficiency. And your goal here is uh, you want to increase the percent of ideas that you can retrieve later when they're useful. So mm. you're sitting meeting with your colleagues and um, there's you read a business book and there was like this negotiation tactic in it that could be useful in helping to persuade them of your idea. And you need to like actually apply that in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or whatever. All right, so how do you do that? So, um, okay, so let me, I think here, what might be the most helpful is I'll describe how my system has evolved over time because I actually don't have one system to recommend here. I've got, there's a bunch of different systems and like, I'm just gonna like throw a bunch at you and mm -hmm. like whichever resonates, just try it yourself. Okay, so the first thing I did um, was I started by just highlighting. And I think that's like the easiest thing to do is like just highlight the things that are interesting. It's very passive and you won't get that much out of it, but like it's really easy to just highlight stuff as you go. Um, mm -hmm. It's just way too passive. Oh, by the way, the high level mental model here for like retention is that you need to make it, you need to like actively process the information as much as you can. So the metaphor mm -hmm. I like to use is imagine that that each idea is like a ping pong ball in your head and you want to like wrap it in Velcro and like the more hooks that you add to it, like the more things that ping pong ball can connect to. And mm -hmm. so when you first learn an idea, you might only have one hook on it. Like you have this really fragile understanding of the idea. Uh, like you've only heard it one time. Um, and uh, and then the more that you hear the idea, the more Velcro you add to it. And then the more ideas you can connect it to. And then pretty soon, like your mind goes from looking like Basically, when you're really familiar with a bunch of ideas, your mind is like a jungle that has like a bunch of highways between it where you can like uh -huh. easily get around uh -huh. idea to idea. But the first time you're learning about an idea, you're like hacking your way through it with like a hacksaw and you're like right. really slowly going through the jungle. But the more time you go through it, every time you every time you rehearse that idea, like you get through that path a little easier. And if you come up with more examples of how it can be applied, then you get more hooks. And then pretty soon that idea is like fluent. You know, like when you're yeah. when you first learn language and like you only know how to use a word like in a very narrow context. And eventually you can use that word in creative ways and you can use right. it fluently. I think it's like idea fluency for as many different ideas as possible. This is like coherence or network density. or something. I mean, the visualization I'm having as you're saying that is your mind is a network, obviously. So the more uh, connection points you establish with the idea, it becomes enmeshed into your mind and network and therefore more retrievable, greater retention, et cetera. Yep. Yep. You want as many different things to remind you of that idea as possible. Yes. Um, yeah. So, okay, how do you do that? Well, the way you do it with learning a language is that like you have to usually start by memorizing a word. Then once you memorize the word, um, you like you start seeing it more. You read a newspaper, you see the word again. You're like, ah, you, you can use that word that way. You, you overhear a conversation with somebody, they use the word. And you keep seeing it like used in different ways. And pretty soon that word for you has a bunch of Velcro hooks. And you're way more likely to mm -hmm. remember to use it yourself when it's relevant. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. 
Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Element. Element is a delicious electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. Element contains the ideal electrolyte ratio. It's got 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Element has no junk. It's got no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS at all. Element is perfectly suited for people that are on a keto, low-carb, or paleo diet. And as someone that eats a very heavy meat diet and does a lot of intermittent fasting, I simply love this stuff. So go to drinkelement.com slash breedlove. That's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash breedlove. And make sure to get a free sample pack with your first purchase. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Uh, okay, so how do you add as many Velcro hooks as possible? Um, so first, um, start by highlighting. Just make sure you highlight anything that seems mildly interesting. Um, it's a, like, experienced readers are pretty much all highlighters. Um, I don't actually think I know anybody who doesn't, any, any experienced readers who don't highlight a lot. Um, so, so that's a no-brainer. Make sure you highlight stuff. Um, what I used to do is like write in margin. If it's a physical book, write in margins. You want to be as active as possible. Like argue with the author. Like write down key ideas. Even make fancy highlights. Right. Like mm -hmm. highlight some things more than other things. Um, circle things. Um, write them down your own words. Um, okay. So those are some basic things. Uh, now, how do you actually remember this stuff later? So you have to. Okay. So um, space repetition is a mental model that's critically important. The basic idea is very simple. You forget things according to an exponential decay function. So Ebbinghaus mm -hmm. um, was the first one to map this out decades ago. And uh, the basic idea is that like, you need to review everything you want to remember. Um, so what I did, okay, the way that I first integrated this idea was um, uh, I reviewed everything that I wanted to remember on a schedule of a day later, a week later, a month later, and then every six months. So I just had like a queue system set up where like I'd learn something interesting. I'd write down, I'd highlight something and then I'd review that thing I highlighted the next day and then a week later and then a month later and then every six months. Mm -hmm. um, and I just used like in the beginning really simple docs for it. And then I started building uh, more advanced systems and I started using Anki quite a bit. Anki is a is the most popular space repetition um, cards app. Um, Anki is great. Um, I definitely recommend that. Um, How do you spell that? Sorry. Uh, Anki, A-N-K-I. A-N-K-I, okay. Yeah. Um, and also one thing that most people don't know is like Anki. So Anki is basically just an app that like makes it easy to create, um, cards. So basically like you, it's, they're like flashcards essentially, but you can, but it makes it easy to schedule them so that you review them according to a space repetition schedule. You need to space it out mm. the right way, you know, maximize retention. Got it. Um, well, the most important thing is that you just come back to ideas every once in a while. It doesn't mm. really need to be 
it, you don't have to be too scientific about it. The most important thing is just you do need to review things that you want to remember, though. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so the, one of the biggest breakthroughs I had um, for retention was when I started to. Um, so I used to just have a bunch of journals and I used to like put up, like, I used to like literally take a piece of paper and I would write down ideas that I thought were interesting. And I would like put them up all over my room and my dorm room when I was in college looked like a full wall of crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so that did work though. And then, but I noticed this problem is like, okay, so I put up this, actually, I started doing this when I was like, uh, probably like 13, 14 and I had, my bedroom was filled with these things, but I kept noticing that like, I'd put up a thing on the wall and then I would just stop noticing it after a few weeks. Like it would just be boring and not interesting. So mm -hmm. then I would take the thing on the wall and I'd move it to a different part of the room. And then I would notice it for a while again. You know, maybe like I notice it, like I get like 50 to hundred times where I notice it before it becomes like background and I don't see it anymore, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I kept moving them around my room and then I would like rewrite the same card like in different words. So it become novel again. And I basically learned that you just have to keep mixing it up because otherwise it'll be boring and mm -hmm. not interesting. So the biggest breakthrough I made in doing this systematically was I started, I, I came across this app called Intently, um, which is now defunct. But the basic idea was um, you can replace all of your internet ads with pictures of whatever you want. And uh, the original, the founder, uh, who's actually a friend of mine, his idea was like, hey, what if you replace advertising with uh, like images that inspire you, like motivational quotes or like beautiful nature photos or something like that. And I was like, that's a great idea. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that. Um, and so I basically started filling up all of my internet ads with hustle porn. Because at the time I was like, you know, <laughs> early 20s CEO grind set, like, uh, you know, and so like hustle porn really resonated with me. So I basically went onto like, I just went and grabbed like a bunch of stuff off Instagram um, and Google image search that resonated with me. Lots of Tony Robbins quotes, you know, like mm -hmm. Gary V, things like that. That was the zone that I was in and it was really useful. But then I, I noticed that like I, I had banner blindness. I kept not even seeing those ads anymore. I was like, okay, well, how do I get myself to see them again? I added like a couple hundred, right? So I had two problems. One was that I wasn't even noticing anymore that those like hustle porn things were, were there. And the second was that I saw those hustle porn quotes so many times, they weren't really resonating anymore. So I, mm -hmm. I had to keep adding more things to my system. Uh, but first of all, how did I solve the problem of getting myself to notice the um, the banner ads? So um, I took the, I crossed by the idea of like, instead of just looking at ads, like what if I just took those same images and I put them somewhere else where I have spare attention. And so I started installing them into, I, I added them to my like desktop background that was rotating constantly. So that was one way. And that's the thing that I'd recommend to um, if you use your desktop. Um, so you can add those images to your desktop background. By the way, you can add anything that like you want to remember. You can add your flashcards. Um, you can add highlights from books. Um, you can add quotes that resonate with you, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so actually I'll show you, I'll show you, one version of the system as it evolved. Um, so I added, I create, I had a bunch of these like digital photo frames, um, and you can see I have these up all over my uh, my apartment. And these are just my notes. You can see a bunch of bullet points and graphs. Mm -hmm. um, and I have these things. So this one, I have this one in the kitchen because I'm just like sometimes I'm standing here at the sink and I've got spare attention, so I just look over at it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, I've got these up in the bathroom too because in the bathroom you've got spare attention, and so you can just see your notes. Um, so it's just rotating notes. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. So they rotate every uh, every fifteen seconds. It mm. it shows. It's another screenshot of like my Google Docs where I save notes. And yes, I use mm. Google Docs for notes um, because uh, I tried a lot of fancy systems. And uh, yeah, I just found that like the extra features added clutter that actually made it harder for me to use. And so I use Google Docs. Yeah. Um, and so okay. So basically, like, so I've got these screens up in each of the bathrooms, um, so that when I'm like you know shitting, showering, shaving, I've got some spare attention. I can then go and uh, just look at my notes. Um, and then because they cycle over 15 seconds, like I only get, I get like maybe two to 300 reps a day. So if you think about like reps mm -hmm. as in like you're an athlete, you're trying to like, you know, if you want to get better at shooting free throws, you shoot free throws, right? You go to the mm -hmm. driving range, you get golf balls, you hit a thousand golf balls a day, you get better. I'm trying to get learning reps. It's like, how many times have I seen that idea? Um, and I can only see each idea so many times before it becomes boring. And boredom is like a really, really useful compass. Uh, boredom is your brain's way of saying you are stuck in a local maximum. Get out, try mm -hmm. something new, try mm -hmm. more shit. <laughs> um, and so with each of these notes that I, I wrote down, um, I can only see them, um, somewhere between like a hundred and 200 times before they're boring. And then I have to like mm -hmm. replace them with new notes. So over the course of me building the system out, um, it has been, I've been working on it now, uh, for, you know, uh, about 12, well, th this particular note system for about 12 years, um, I have around 24,000 notes in it right now. Hmm. Um, and it's not 24,000 ideas. It's like 24,000, mostly they're screenshots of like a bunch of notes because I take lots of notes when I'm reading. Right. Hmm. Uh, and so, so what happens is I can only have like maybe a thousand of those screenshots in my note system at a time, because what happens is every couple of months they're boring again and I got to add new ones. So I have to like keep re-adding new things into my system. But the key idea is that with every idea that I thought was interesting enough to write down in note form, I will see that idea a couple hundred times. 
And mm-hmm. so the probability of me being able to retrieve that later um, is way higher because I've seen that idea, uh, you know, two to 300 times. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I'm walking around the house, I'm getting a bunch of reps. So mm-hmm. um, it's like a very passive way to like get re-exposed to a bunch of ideas that like past Emerson thought were interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I definitely recommend that if you're, if you're, if that seems like daunting, overwhelming, the best place to start, oh, by the way, you can also add to your home, uh, your phone, home screen, another good place to do it. So basically anything that you want to remember, um, it could be your Anki cards. It could be highlight. Oh, oh, before I started doing it this way, actually, I should also explain the evolution, how I got to that point. So I started off with just like quotes that were resonating with me. And then I basically, I added a couple thousand quotes. Um, I just spent a lot of time on Pinterest and, um, like quote websites and things like that. And then I kind of just ran out of like quotes that resonate with me. And then I was like, wait, wait, well, I've been reading a book a day for most of my life. And so I have like. I have tens of thousands of uh, highlighted sections in my book. So I just like, I literally went through, I took photos of all the like sections I highlighted in these books. Huh. And then I uploaded all the photos. So there's a paragraph that resonated with me in some nonfiction book I read a long time ago. Um, I would upload a photo of that like underlined section into my screens. Um, and then and then basically all those became boring. And uh, then I started just adding all my new notes because I started taking way, way, way more notes. Okay, so anyway, so you can like borrow from that liberally, whatever resonates with you, go for it. And the most important idea though of all this, we zoom out for a moment is like, um, make sure that you're seeing your notes more often and try to actively process them. This is like fluffy and hard to like communicate, but like if you just mm-hmm. reread your notes, you're only gonna get a little bit of value. Like mm-hmm. it's still good, but it's only gonna give you a little bit of value because it's still passive. You know, like you've got to more actively try to process it. So that's like one part of my note system. The bigger, the bigger, um, the biggest breakthrough I've made in my note system in years though, um, I've been doing now for um, about 15 months. Basically I started using uh, audio notes. So the way that I do my notes now, um, I still use these as well, but basically on my phone, I've got a widget here. There's an app called Easy Voice Recorder Pro. Mm-hmm. And I basically just like, I tap this, I have a widget here. I tap this little red button and I record myself saying something and then I hit the pause button and then it adds to a single audio file. Um, and this audio file right here is like six minutes long. And then once I get to 20 minutes of these notes, then I add it to my podcast player and I listen to it later. So mm-hmm. what do I record? So basically like the way that I do this is that whenever I'm, let's say I'm reading a book and I read a, uh, let's say there was like a two paragraph segment that seemed interesting to me. So what I do is like, I pause, I'm like, okay, that seemed, that was interesting. Like some interesting like story. Mm-hmm. Here's an example. So let's say that like, I read a stat that showed that like incumbents win 70% of elections on average globally. Incumbents in elections win 70% of elections globally. I was like, okay, interesting. And then what I used to do is I used to just like say that into my voice recorder and listen to it later, but I realized I actually need to process it more actively. Um, so how do I do that? So what I do now is like, I, I hit the record button. Uh, and then I say something like, on average, 70% of incumbents win uh, you know, globally. And then what I'll do is I'll say to myself, like, why does this matter? Or like, why is this interesting? Or how might I use this later? Those are like, like, Mm-hmm. Those are like my three kind of main questions. And so I'll say like, okay, that's interesting because that's a good base rate. Because if you're trying to predict who's going to win any given election, you should assume that the incumbent's going to win 70% of the time on average. Most people don't assume that, right? Most people assume they hear about an election, they assume it's like 50-50, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not 50-50, it's 70-30. So mm-hmm. if you have the, just that one stat in your mind and you apply it this way, you will be able to, you'll be better at predicting outcomes of elections than the vast majority of people who intuitively assume by default that 50-50 should be your starting prior for the election, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I might say that in my notes. And then and then the way it works, I've got this giant, like I've got... um these notes. And uh, I, w- the way that they work is that I, I have them on my phone. I have them automatically transcribed into text transcripts. I use Otter AI for this, like Otter, O-T-T-E-R dot AI. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll go back and I'll read them later with audio. I also listen to them. So for example, so I've got like, so every 20 minutes, it creates an audio file with all these notes. Another example, by the way, just to try to make this, because I'm trying to explain the idea of like actively processing it, because I'm trying to store this information to maximize the probability of future Emerson being able to retrieve it when it's useful. So I give the example of 70% incumbent, like I store it that way. So like now, whenever I hear an election, I think incumbent has 70% chance of winning. So um, another example of this could be like something that doesn't, it's not as obviously useful. Like, oh, I saw a stat that was like in 1750 in Vienna, one in six women were prostitutes. One in six women were prostitutes. And okay, why is that interesting and useful? Like it has a much lower probability of being useful, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that still updates my beliefs about what the world was like back then, where prostitution, mm-hmm. I basically update like, okay, that the reason why I find this interesting is because it means that prostitution was probably, if you can generalize that to other cities, which I think you probably can, prostitution was more common in the past than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I should update my beliefs towards like thinking that prostitution was a bigger part of the human condition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's, again, way less I can be useful, especially if like a lot of you guys listening to this right now, you're like, man, I got bills to pay. I, I need like a really specific <laughs> skill set, like money or like, you know, and like, 
you know, you, you know, rock on, man, like for sure. Yeah. Um, and like I'm in a history right now. So like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's much less applied. But the key thing is that like, you, you will try to make it as useful as possible, as like interesting as possible. And here's something really important. Okay, so the way this basically works is that, so I make all these voice notes um, and I listen to them later. So every single day I'm go, I go for a couple walks and I just listen. Uh, so I listen to, let's say I listen to like 30 minutes a day of my old notes. Um, mm -hmm. And as I'm listening, I'm walking around, I got my clicker again. So every time I hear the note, I try to like actively reprocess it every single time. Mm. Um, and I try to make sure that, and so I click after every note. And what I do is I sub vocalize. Basically like I'm trying to keep, there's a, um, man, this is going to be hard to say. Actually, I'll, I'll go into that one in a second. Um, so the main idea here is that like, you need to re-listen to your old notes um, or you can reread your old notes. I do both. I reread my old notes and I re-listen to my old notes. Um, and I spend about, I spend an average of an hour a day. I spend about 30 minutes a day making new notes. And I spend about 30 minutes a day listening to my old notes. So it's basically like an hour a day of like making notes and reviewing my old notes. Um, I think the best version of Emerson would probably do it more than an hour, um, but I get too bored doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to use boredom as a compass. Boredom mm -hmm. is like a really, really cool tool. So one reason why the system works really well is because I get lots of feedback on if my notes are actually working or not. Because let's say I take a note, like right now I'm currently listening to my notes that are about three months old. So three months ago, Emerson recorded a note and he thought that something was interesting and might be useful later. And then when I listen today, after this you know, podcast, I'm going to go for a walk on the beach right here, and I'm going to be listening, and I'm going to be like, if I'm bored, then it means that like past Emerson wasn't accurately predicting what future Emerson was going to be thinking. Or mm -hmm. if I explain it in a way that like, I don't like, I'm like, what, what was I talking about? Like, mm -hmm. it, I'm confused. Uh, that means I did mm -hmm. a bad job of teaching it. Because basically, one of, the, one of the mental models here is like, the best way to learn is to teach. Mm -hmm. to learn more deeply, teach it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I, spent my whole, I was trying to figure out like, how do I, who do I teach though? Because like, it's hard to teach this stuff because there's a lot of inferential gap. It might be like, I need to spend like a month on background before you, like somebody else even understands what I'm talking about with this mm -hmm. idea. And there's a lot of friction there. And, uh, but, but the big breakthrough is realizing, wait, I can teach my future self. Hmm. And, wow. um, yeah, I can teach myself from the future. Um, and so I still have to explain it in a way that like future Emerson will understand it, but it really forces me to like, understand it when I'm taking. So here, here's, here's what's going on in my head all the time. Like this is what goes on in my head all day. So I'm reading and I'm like, eh, mildly interesting, mildly interesting, boring. I don't know why the author's talking about this. Like, I don't know why the author's talking about this. I'm like, generally, I spend a lot of time being bored, just hoping that something good comes along, just chasing mm -hmm. the next hop, right? Mm -hmm. Then the author says something that is like, interesting. And so I pause and I, I stop. I pause a lot while I'm reading and I think, and I, I like reread that paragraph again. And then if that seems like, okay, that's actually interesting enough to where like, I, I think future Emerson, I predict, that Emerson three months from now will find this interesting too. I find it interesting right now. And mm -hmm. I think it'll be interesting for like three months from now, Emerson will also find that interesting. So then I'll, I'll pull up my phone and I'll basically like restate it in my own words. And typically I'll restate my words and I'll say it two or three times. Cause I found that if I just say the same thing two or three mm -hmm. times, wording slightly differently, it adds more Velcro hooks to my ping pong ball. Yeah, yeah. It increases the probability I'm able to retrieve it later, right? So I'll restate the same idea two or three times. And then I'll say like, why is this interesting? Or how might I use this later? And then it forces me to like think about it and come up with some reason, right? And I'll just record myself saying it and then I'll go back to reading it. And I just do that throughout the day. And I record, my average note is like maybe 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I just have this giant like archive of all these voice notes now. Um, and um, okay, so th that's that's how the notes work in a general sense. Now, when I'm reading, um, here's this is like an advanced idea and, and this is probably not gonna resonate with most people, but like there's gonna be some, maybe like 5% of people listening to this, this will just really click. Um, and uh, I wouldn't, I, there's a good chance this is going on in just inside your head too. So there's like this voice in your head all the time when you're reading, you're sub vocalizing, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, sometimes you're just literally saying the same thing that the author's saying out loud. Um, sometimes you're like adding your own commentary over it. And basically when I'm clicking, like when I'm reading, so again, I've got like, you know, there's a little chipmunk voice that's saying stuff and I'm reading. I'm trying to actively process the words um, as deeply as possible. So what that means is that like, not only am I trying to comprehend what the author is saying, I'm also trying to like, I'll actually, okay, so I'll, I'll try to give you some examples, the kinds of things that pop my head when I'm reading and the kinds of things I say in my head to try mm -hmm. to like deepen my like ability to process information. So the author is saying something and I'm saying, I, and I might say in my head, there'd be like random thoughts pop in there like, huh, interesting. Or like, I'll restate the exact same sentence in my own words or I'll restate like one key word from the sentence, or I'll restate one stat from the sentence. So that was interesting. Or I'll say things like my, my inner voice will say something like, is that true? Or my inner voice will say something like, um, uh, like that reminds me of this other idea over here mm -hmm. or, or like, or like somebody, maybe like the author wrote like a whole paragraph to say something that I could have summarized in the idea of concentrated energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just say like concentrated energy. 
or I'll say like a mental model that it reminds me of, um, like confirmation bias or mm -hmm. um, something like that. And so basically what's going on here is that the clickers, I'm basically trying to keep like the, the like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to have like reading at two levels all the time. One level is where I'm comprehending what the author's saying. That's the bare minimum. My goal is like mm -hmm. always, always, always to be comprehending like every word the author's saying. The level above it though, is where I'm actively analyzing like what mm -hmm. the author's saying and like how I can store this for future retrieval. And so basically right. like why I click, um, I actually, what I do is I actually, I use the clicker after every sentence um, as a way to keep the voice, the active voice in my head, continually analyzing what the author's saying. And basically I notice that if I don't use the clicker, then I forget about the voice. Um, and then I go back into like passive mode where I'm just like, I'm like sort of awake and you know, I'm sort of paying attention. And yeah. then I'm like, wait, pay attention again. And then I get back into clicking after every sentence. And it reminds me to like stay and really actively be like engaging with the content. And you know what it's like when you engage with the content really actively, right? And you're like really yeah. thinking about what you're trying to say and how it applies to other things and so on. Um, so that's like something, that's like the game that I play all day is I'm trying to have like 100% active processing of every single sentence that I read throughout the day. I'm currently so nowhere near percent active. That <laughs> is, that's super fucking cool and quite advanced, I guess. So you, there's a level at which you are just consciously focused on the comprehension of what the author is saying, what you are reading, but you're also trying to take a secondary perspective, I guess, from your existing network, like your existing connections of mental models and things that are put together. And you're saying like, what, where does this idea fit into the network that I've already created? I find myself doing something similar when I'm reading that I'll often like mark a paragraph and just write. I have certain in my own mental model, I have certain words or concepts like you were describing concentration of energy, like these things that that one rubric has a ton of ideas under it. And so when I see a paragraph, I'm like, oh, this goes into like the concentration of energy bucket so to speak. Um, and I have a few of those, I don't know, maybe 50 or so of those categories that I use across different books and I write it in the side margin. So when I'm flipping through the book later, I'm like, Oh, there, this pertains to money or this pertains to energy or whatever it may be. Um, but that the way you're describing that is super fascinating. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, bifurcated pers perspectival mode of reading yes. something like that. Like it's very, very powerful. Um, I wanted to ask you one thing about this. So, well, a lot of things, but one thing first, rereading of your favorite books, is that part of your repertoire in retention? Um, cause I found like with some of the biggest ideas, like the books that I read the first time, they're just incredibly dense and difficult, which I actually enjoy. I guess that's like the weightlifting analogy again, like it's a heavy weight basically. Um, I found that going back for a second read, like, especially these books that are classics, you know, um, that I get the new me reads it in a totally different way. Like I get whole, totally different. I'm, if I, even though I read a book that I've previously highlighted or annotated, I find myself highlighting, annotating other sections that I missed previously. So I'm just wondering if that's, um, if you found that to be of value to you and in, in retention or comprehension for that matter. Yeah, um, I definitely reread books. Um, I try to, I use the main way that I review books that really resonated is just reviewing my old notes from those books. Cause usually I would have taken a lot of notes and then I'll try to like reprocess the notes that resonate the most, or I'll go back and I'll reread the highlighted sections and I'll try to like reprocess them because, you know, I'm changing all the time. And like, yeah, like you said, like I'm a very different person now than I was a year ago and two years ago and so on. Yeah. Um, and also one of the most, okay. So one, so, so one useful mental model I have. So, uh, all right. So when you're trying to learn something, uh, you're not really sure. Okay, actually, this is this is a this is actually an important idea. So if you don't know what's important to take notes on, uh, which is usually what happens, you go to a new field, like you don't know what the important ideas are, right? Just like when you're learning a language, like you don't know what the important words are. Um, and then anybody who's like a, a sufficient, like anyone who's a polyglot and good at learning languages knows that like, well, you need the 80-20, the language, you need 80-20 um, and learn the most important words based on which words get used the most often. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and the same thing is true in like every field, basically, there's like some ideas that are more important than other ideas. And most fields have like a power law, like an 80, 20 distribution representing, like there's like a small number of ideas that are really, really, really important. And mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of long tail stuff that isn't that important. Um, and I think actually like an even more powerful corollary to the 80, 20 rule is the 150 rule. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, it's that instead of like, you know, with 80-20 rule, it's like, well, 20% of your effort gets 80% of the results. The 150 rule, which is, it's literally the same distribution, says like the top 1% of your effort gets 50% of the results. Hmm. So that's like a 50x leverage multiplier. 50x. Right. So the 80-20 rule is like a 4x leverage. Uh, the 150 rule is a 50x leverage. So what it indicates oh. is that like, 
don't just stop at A20, like go all the way to like 150. Like what are right. not just like 20% most important, the 1% most important. Um, and then you can take that even further and go to like the 0.1, you know, 350 X rule where like, you know, you yes. get and so on. Um, and that's the same thing. Like, I, I, I think this might be right because I've heard the 80, 20 rule is basically fractal, fractal, fractal or geometric in the sense that if you take 20% of the 20%, you get 4% but you still get 80% of the results. So it's only like 4% gives you 64%. So it yep. sounds like maybe the 150 is like a heuristic yep. for that. Exactly. You just go, you go 80, 20, you know, 464, 150, yeah. 0. 0.1, 350, et right, cetera. Right, you, get right, like 7X, right. you get the 7X multiplier every time. And the time. leverage is exponentially higher at each exactly. increment. Yep. Yeah. So when I'm deciding what to learn, I spend way more time than most people, like trying to figure out like what is the critical, critical information that I need. Cause mm -hmm. just like how it's, once, you, once you've ever had this moment one time of learning a language, when like you start learning language a shitty way where you're like, you're memorizing a bunch of random words that no one uses very often. Mm -hmm. And then like one day you're like, wait a minute, if I just learned like the 300 most common words, <laughs> <laughs> like, I know like half of the words that are useful. And yeah. that is just like a holy shit moment, but everything works that way. And yeah. so then the question is, like, well, how do you actually know what the 150 words are, what the 150 ideas are in a given field? Um, the way you do it is actually just by like, just immersing yourself into the field quickly. Like don't actually overthink it in the beginning. Just like, just try to absorb as much as you can. Um, and then notice which ideas keep coming up, like certain yeah. jargon that keep coming up. Um, and then that tells you what are the most important ideas that you should like make sure you understand. But, and this is actually really useful because it tells you like, if you keep hearing a word come up over and over again, like if you're studying biology, you're like biology 101 and you keep hearing about replication, but mm -hmm. keep hearing about translation, then you know that that must be an important thing. Or in the beginning, most beginning level, it's like you know, DNA mm -hmm. or etymology or something. Mm -hmm. And then like the, basically the more times you hear a word come up, the more pressure builds for you to go and learn what that idea is. Like, what does that mm -hmm. word mean? And so, so what I, when I first go into a new field, what I start doing is I start by like, oftentimes just listening to like random, like insider podcasts. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and I don't even know what's going on. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but I'm like getting a, like a quick, like jargon map of mm -hmm. like what jargon they keep using. Um, and so, uh, and so, so that helps me like figure out like, what are the most important ideas I need to learn and in what order. And then I basically just like start learning the most important ideas in the most important order. And then eventually I get to a certain point of diminishing returns where like to get to the next level in that particular field would require like a thousand hours of extra labor. And I just kind of want to 80, 20, every field, you know, I want to like mm -hmm. 150. Mm -hmm. One point I decided, I was like, I was like, I'm going to 150 every single scientific field. And I got through <laughs> about 300 of them. And then I got kind of bored. Um, cause the same basic models apply in most fields. Um, like once you understand like the basics of biology, then like you have the basics of all the other fields that are like biology subfields. And then you have to right. learn like, okay, what's well, new about this subfield? And then there's not that many new ideas to learn to get the basics of like what that field is doing differently than the field next door, et cetera. Right, right. Uh, so this is like, yeah. So this is how you basically figure out like with languages, you don't have to do any of this because languages, you just look up like most frequently used words in Spanish and then you yes. just can you know, learn those words. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you can use that in other fields. Uh, the, you're segueing great into the next question I had, which was the value of learning other languages. I've, I've heard of this concept of linguistic relativity, where the actual language you are thinking or speaking in has some, some effect on the thoughts you are able to form. Um, and I, I, I only speak English, so I don't have a lot to say on this, but I'm, I don't know if you speak other languages and if so, uh, have you found that to be useful in terms of forming new thoughts or new thinking patterns or mental models, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, I'm a big believer in learning other languages. I, I don't learn other languages. I learn other languages that I think are more likely to be useful, which are mostly like different scientific languages um, mm -hmm. and like different mental model languages, but not so much traditional languages, mostly because I think that the shelf life on learning other languages, like I speak a bit of Spanish and mm -hmm. um I think like, for example, learning programming languages is, is like, uh, you know, is more, is more likely to be useful unless you're moving to a country or something, then it can be pretty right. practical to learn language. Um, but if you're not planning to move to that country, then like, I don't know, I think we have like five, 10 years tops before we have universal real-time language translation software where right. um, you just speak fluently in any language without having had spent, you know, a couple thousand right. hours to, to speak it. And so it's just more likely that that it's less likely that that will be useful in the long run. Yeah. Um, and most of the best content's in English. Um, and so like, if I was, you know, not a native English speaker, I would definitely be, you know, fluent in English um, because mm -hmm. like best content is in English online. Yeah. Um, but, but the way I think about languages is that like every time you, every time you like go in 150, a new field, you basically like learn the lingo of the field and you learn like the most important mental models of the field. And then you can cross by those other fields, not every mm -hmm. other field. Like you're right. Mm -hmm. There's some mental models that apply to all fields. Like you understand the concept of a power law, like mm -hmm. the 80, 20, mm -hmm. then like that applies to every single scientific field. You can go into any field and just like by, by default, you have like 
the uh, the godlike ability to predict that this distribution is going to pop up everywhere in this sphere. Mm -hmm. You're going to mm -hmm. say like uh, that. I would guess is a Pareto distribution. That is like probably Pareto-ish. That's probably Pareto-ish, and um, you can make a lot of predictions off that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, you know, other distributions reappear everywhere, like normal distributions, bell curves, like that's the, my first thought is like every distribution is like, assume it's either a, uh, a normal distribution or a power law, like a 80, uh -huh. you know, 20 distribution by default, because those are the two most common ones that pop up. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, sometimes they're noisy and not like that, but anyway, it gives you the ability to like make lots of predictions in a given field and like learn much faster. Whereas like people who don't have that mental model of the 80, 20 rule, uh, they like, you can tell that somebody doesn't really have that model when they're like, this is going to sound crazy, but like, <laughs> Did you know that a small number of rich people have like a large percentage <laughs> of the wealth? And uh and it's like, yeah, that's yeah. It's like same, same for the, the stars in the universe. Yeah. 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 The small percentage yeah. of the stars have most of the mass. Yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. 20% of your problems cause 80% of your pain, 20% yeah. of your ideas, or 80% of the value you create, et cetera. And so, like, you can just tell that most people haven't really, they don't understand the pattern. So they're like, whenever it sees, they're like, oh my God, that's crazy that like such a small amount of people have so much wealth. Um, and but then if you're like really fluent in it, you're like, yeah, by default, that's how nature works. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think of those as like those are the languages that are most useful to learn is like these kind of statistical mental model languages that you can then cross apply from field to field. Yeah. And then, and then, and then one thing I think about a lot is like, how do you get more feedback loops? Because one thing is like one of the most robust findings from the field of learning to learn is that most people don't get better at their jobs pretty quickly after they start their jobs because they don't mm. get any feedback. Um, mm. And you know, the, the idea of 10,000 hours is um, it's not really about hours. It's actually about like 10,000 feedback loops. Mm. Um, and you see this over and over field by field, like doctors, it's very common that like doctors don't get better at like being doctors and no matter how, like they get better for the first you know few years and they just kind of stop getting better or first five years, whatever. Surgeons though, oftentimes they keep getting better um, until way later in their career because like they find out if the patient died or not. Um, mm -hmm. So because of that, like there's feedback loops. And so they, you know, tend to get better. And you see the same thing in like job after job, field after field. And so, so I, I think a lot about like, how do you actually get feedback loops so that you can improve? And uh, one of the ways that I think about that is basically like, how do you test yourself? Which is why I like the note system I'm using right now is like constantly testing myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really, really excited right now for like, uh, AI, um, to make it easier to test. I think we're, we're, there's already apps that do this. They're a little clunky right now, not quite good enough, but I think in the next couple of years, especially GPT-4, like you'll be able to just like input anything you read and it'll output a quiz. So you can like actually, cause this is like all these fancy things I've been telling you about like weird clickers and stuff like that, like to try to stay more awake. Like if you just know that you're gonna be quizzed on it, you'll pay attention. Like mm -hmm. magically mm -hmm. you'll find the ability to like pay close attention. And we're so close to being able to just quiz yourself. Like all the time automatically on whatever you're reading as a weight as a forcing function um so i'm just like really 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 excited for that yeah no that sounds really cool too um let, let me ask you this so if we if you need to jump at any time let me know i've just got a couple of other questions though the importance of writing um the ideas that you wish to be able to verbalize or recall competently uh, I found, I just magically backed into this realization, but I always been a big reader. Uh, only recently had I started writing. I really wish I had started doing this way earlier. Like when I was reading actually, because I found that when I read about something and then go through the very painful process of writing about it, like writing about something you plan on publishing publicly, right. For others to review, like not just something you're writing for yourself which involves a lot of editing and recursion and, you know, typically getting feedback from other people. Like you write a thing, you have someone edit it. They say, this doesn't make sense to me. You have to unpack it, re repack it, et cetera. I found that when I read about it, go through the painful process of writing and then talk about what I wrote on a podcast, there's something really magical to all those ideas. Like they become so embedded in my network, I guess, that they're very easily accessible. Like I can talk about things I wrote years ago without even having to think about it or refresh. It just comes up very easily. Whereas if I've only read about it, I need to refresh or I need to think about it before I go and talk about it. Do you find value in the, the writing process? And if so, how do you fit it into your, your whole practice? Yeah. Um, hundred percent. Um, writing, basically my voice notes are like my version of writing where I have to mm -hmm. explain it in a way that like me in a year from now or three months from now, will actually understand it. Um, it's not the same thing as writing about it for a public audience, because you have mm -hmm. to like, if you're writing about it for a public audience, you have to like put yourself in the minds of all the different people who are writing it. So for example, this whole podcast, what you and I have both been doing is like, we're holding like, there's like simulacra of like listeners in our heads. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. um, they're asking questions. And then we're thinking like, what will a, what will somebody who's got like a normal white collar job, who's like curious um, and uh, is like unclear about what they want to do with their life, but they know they want mm -hmm. something more than this. And what are they going to be thinking? Like, cause one thing I, I, I like, for example, a mistake I make all the time is like, I'm too theoretical about these things and I need to be more applied. Like just read mm -hmm. more books, read more books. And cause that's, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever. Right. So we're, so we're both doing that all the time. Now, when I'm doing my voice notes, I'm only thinking about what will future Emerson be thinking. So it's much easier, of course, than trying to understand what like this diverse audience um, will be thinking. Um, I, I kept thinking like, okay, I need to teach, I need to teach publicly. But then I kept getting hung up on the like, ah, but like most of the things that I'm interested in, like it takes a lot of work to figure out where the audience is knowledge wise. And then like, mm -hmm. what are all the ideas I have to build up in the right order? Um, because a lot of these ideas, like I have to build up like a hundred different ideas in, in the right sequence in order for like this idea to like be interesting. And it takes a lot of work to like figure out where everyone else is at and so on. Um, but you're hundred percent right that like, if you go through that process, um, it, it forces you to like, basically one of the biggest, the biggest reason why writing works is because you figure out if you actually understood it or not. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, right. Like you can't, explain it if you don't understand it um right. and that's what happens to me all the time when i'm doing my voice notes is i'm like i thought i understood that but then i realized i didn't understand it and i got to go back and reread that page again or reread that paragraph again or whatever and then i close my eyes i grab the phone and i try to explain it and then what often happens is i get like i'm like 10 seconds into my explanation I'm like shit i didn't understand it yeah i gotta go ahead and read it again <laughs> yeah, yeah and then I'm like oh, okay i think i got it now you know <laughs> this is where this is where uh, people always say if you can't explain it to a five-year-old or whatever the you know child's age is that you don't really understand it like you, to be able to distill that idea into something super palatable and complex for a general audience is the art but obviously that's not entirely possible like there's some ideas that are just so damn complex it's really hard to boil them down but um at least seems that that's a useful aim okay one last question you mentioned Offline, you travel often. You're doing this practice on the road too. Are there any specific travel tips or techniques that you use when you're on the road that you don't use when you're at home or, or how do you handle that? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So basically uh, about five years ago, I exited my previous business and I've just been traveling the world um, about eight months a year with my um, with my partner and my brother. Uh, we also co-founded um, a business um, and essentially we just live out of Airbnbs. Typically we do two weeks to a month per Airbnb. Uh, we try to minimize, weirdly enough, flying. Like we mostly just like, mm -hmm. we'll do a thing like we'll go to Europe, we'll pick up a car in Luxembourg and we'll drop it off in Portugal at the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we'd be hop like through West Southern Europe. Um, and nice. uh, so we like really streamlined systems for like not wasting a bunch of time on like normal travel things. Yeah. Um, and like just really, really tight systems for that. Um, which is the only way to do it. Like most people travel and it's really chaotic and hectic and there's like tons of like overhead and it's, it's just draining. And so they can't like travel all the time. Um, right. and it was like for us too when we first started, but then we got our systems tighter and tighter. Um, but in general, like I just have like a million gadgets um, that I use. <laughs> uh, huh. Like even in my desk in front of me right now, I've got like, okay, so I've got like, I tested like every mouse in the world. I found this is the best mouse that has the, the right buttons and features and so on. Oh. Ergonomic mouse pad, reading stand, um, like these headphones, I tried like every kind of headphone and uh, like these uh, Google Pixel Buds Pro, best noise canceling, easy, good features. Like there's just like a million little like, yeah, tech hacks like that. Mm -hmm. uh, on an average day, what I do is like I wake up and I work out of like some beautiful cafe or restaurant in the morning. And then I go to some beautiful cafe or restaurant in the afternoon because mm -hmm. um, I like to get the vibe. Um, and then, you know, come back and hang out at the Airbnb until dinner. Um, and so um, basically, I just like uh, one of the most important things, by the way, is just headphones. Just like I have headphones in all day. I'm basically mm -hmm. listening to, I'm listening to audiobooks and podcasts like almost every minute of the day when I'm not at my computer. And then when I'm at my computer, I'm usually, you know, reading. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, I read, I read, I'm basically reading like almost every minute of the day. Um, oh. unless I'm like actively working on something or processing something. Um, yeah. uh, but yeah, basically headphones are just like a, there's, they, I just found them to be like a huge hack for like making sure I can unplug from the world. I'm in a busy cafe. I like the ambient hum of like human energy. I like being around people in yeah. general and like cafes just have like a really good, like upbeat, like, you know, yeah. um, there's like a million hacks. I'm not even sure where to start though. Cause we just have so many, like, so many <laughs> But you're doing this, I guess the general question without getting into the nitty gritty mechanics is you're running this same process and practice on the road that you're doing at home. Yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. In fact, this is actually the first time I've actually had a home in like, yeah, about five years because uh, and it's only for about four months a year. 
Um, yeah. but yeah, you can do this on the road too. It's just like, it takes a little bit more work to figure out like how to do it. And I, you know, it's, for most people, it's not a good place to start in the beginning. No. Keep it simple. You know, like yes. get your, have your reading practice, like, you know, in the quiet in the morning, your home and your office, there's no distractions. You've got everything. You got your coffee just so, and you know, yeah. like you yeah. know, don't, don't start with a, being trying to be a nomad. Awesome. Emerson, dude, thank you for the very dense download. Actually, Robert, let me, there's one more thing that yeah. I just saw my note. I, yeah, want to please. Say. I think it's actually really high leverage. Um, so basically there, I, I, maybe about like a third of the people that are listening to this podcast right now, you're thinking like, uh, you know, like you're, 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 you're listening to this podcast. Obviously you're like curious about like a wide variety of things. This is like a, this is a polymath podcast. Um, mm. Like there, there are, there, there aren't that many podcasts that have such a breadth of guests talking about such advanced ideas. So, oh, so I would say to be a third of you, <laughs> uh, and that's why this is, this is uh, one of my favorite podcasts. Um, nice. and, um, it's really hard by the way, Robert, what you pulled off like this breadth of topics, uh, at this advanced level, it's like really hard to not lose people. There's just like a really small amount of people that like can be interested in this many different things at this level. Cause there's, there's podcasts that cover a lot of topics, but they're like normie topics. Yeah. You know, like more and uh, so it's easier to get diversity but like it's rare that you can do diversity and really high level at the same yeah, time i'm amazed i've been amazed at the download numbers frankly because i thought it would be more niche but, yeah. but there's a lot of poly curious people out there i guess <laughs> yeah you found a weird big niche that i never would have expected to be quite as big it's, yeah. it's usually really 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 hard yeah. to pull off and it's it's a testament too to your ability to like it's like it, it feels like the podcast is like a reflection of your essence. Like I feel like this podcast is like what your mind looks like inside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it sort of is. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the tactic though is okay. So let's say there's about a third of you guys listening to this right now. Um, you're trying to find out some something to do in life. Um, what you're doing right now isn't it. And you know it's not it. And there's like a ladder in front of you. And usually you have some ladder that's like the safe ladder, and you got some ladder that's like the risky ladder that could lead to some better outcome. Um, Probably if I had to give like one piece of advice, um, it's find some, you're, you're, ob you're obviously a generalist, you're a polymath, you're listening to this, like by definition, wouldn't you be interested in this if you weren't. Um, so the best thing to do if you're a polymath is to find some weird combination of things that you're uniquely good at. You know, like there's this Naval quote that has been, that stuck with me for years, which is do what to others feels like work, but to you feels like play. Mm. And for me, that's learning. Like I just like, I read every minute of the day and it's fun. It's fun. And I'm reading like dense academic shit that like other people it would be drudgery for them to read, but to me it's play. And so I found sort of my niche. Um, and, and I, and I have like a vague sense of like in some way I'll be able to use this to be a better investor and I'll make more money and I'll be able to create more impact. Um, and, and so for you, what you want to do is you want to like, you want to get to the Pareto frontier at a number of different fields that you're really into. So what I mean by that is that basically like you want to essentially like, like 80, 20, three separate fields and then that's your niche. So um, basically, okay, so let's say that you're like an engineer, uh, but you're also like a good writer and you're like kind of funny. Um, so if you're like, if you're like a kind of good engineer and you're like a kind of good writer and you're kind of funny, like you might be like not good enough as an engineer to like crush it or not good enough as a writer to crush it, not good enough as a comedian to crush it. But like, if you're like 80, 20 good at all three of those, like you could be like a, maybe like a Randall Monroe is a good example, you know, or, or, you know, like XKCD, um, like, you know, or something like that, uh, where mm -hmm. you could build a niche that's like, you're really good at all three. You're like, you're not really good at all three, but you're pretty good at all three. And, um, it's, it's really hard to be number one in the world at any one topic. Um, but it's much easier to be number one in the world at like a combination of three or four skills. And the more that you combine, the easier it is to be number one in it. Um, so the more skills you have, the more things you're interested in actually weirdly enough, the easier it is for you to become number one in the world at that thing. Like an example, this is like a friend of mine, Rob Miles, he has a YouTube, um, channel where he makes AI safety videos, like trying to like, like it's for, it's mostly for like, um, engineers who are interested in like AI alignment. How do we make AI actually align with our values and do the things we want to do instead of doing things we don't want to do. And if you ask him like why he's been so successful with it, um, he's like, well, I'm not like, I'm like, okay. I'm like pretty good at like AI safety stuff, but I'm not a giga brain. Like the guys who are working on it full time are. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm like, you know, pretty good at explaining things. I'm not like the best at explaining things. Um, and I like making videos. I'm like pretty good at videos, but like not the best at making videos, but like you take those three, like videos and explaining things and AI safety. And that was like the perfect combination of three things to where like, he has a great niche and he's got a really large active community and he's adds real value in the AI safety community. So basically like your goal is a polymath. And I'm, I'm really trying to give this advice. This is like the perfect channel for like this kind of advice because like everyone's listening to this, like can resonate with this on some level. So basically like make a list of all the different things you're into. And then just like try to find some combination where like you could combine some of your skills to be where you can actually be like, he's the best person in the world for like AI safety explainer content. And that's a weird niche, right? Mm -hmm. And there's like some weird niche that you could be crushing right now that you would like so much more than your current job. Um, and it's so much better than any of the existing ladders that are available to you, but you have to make your own ladder. Like the world, mm -hmm. like all the big bucks and the big happiness go to people who like make their own, who, who make the maps, not mm -hmm. who follow the maps. And yeah. if you're watching, if you're listening to this right now, like you're a map maker, you're not a map 
like follower. And so, so yeah, just start with a list of things you're interested in and just try to think about like, how could I combine these skills into doing something, uh, doing something that I would love to do and that the market might value. Man, that is so inspirational. I even got chills on that. It's kind of like, um, sort of like the icky guy thing, but the digital yeah. age is now this major enabling technology for people to pursue their icky guy in a profitable, sustainable way. Um, and I love that idea of multiple combining multiple things you're okay at to, to be the best in the world at one niche. That's super cool. Um, Dude, this has been a great conversation. I always love talking to you. Get a lot, a lot out of these conversations. I took copious notes. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, yeah, so I'm mostly still in hermit mode right now. Um, not really creating content um, publicly, but uh, the best way is probably Twitter. Um, so it's at Emerson Sparts on Twitter. Emerson, S-P-A-R-T-Z. Awesome. Emerson, man. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, man. This is fun.